Please allow me, to, allow me to introduce the host of the event, Leader Impact is a global movement. Our mission is to help leaders have impact by helping them grow professionally, personally, and spiritually. We have a network of leaders in 350 cities around the world who meet in small groups. Especially in these difficult times, we want to offer a safe place for leaders to exchange ideas and to learn, to share their personal challenges and to be coached from their peers, to give them opportunities to grow professionally, personally and spiritually. Our time today will be broken into just, just two parts. First, we'll hear from our presenter, Dr. Sandy Sugart. Please use the chat window to ask a question and we will take some of those questions at the end of the presentation. After our Q and A session around uh, five past six, you'll be directed to join a separate Zoom meeting that is specific for your country and you'll have some time to discuss Dr. Sugar's ideas. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Sandy Sugart. I am so excited to have Dr. Sugart with us. Dr. Sanford's Sandy Sugart has served since 2000 as the president of Valencia College, Florida. During his presidency in Valencia College, Re Valencia College received the first Aspen Prize for Excellence. Dr. Sugart has served as president and leader in other education institutions and also is chairman of the board of Orlando Health, a system of eight hospitals with 3,000 beds and 20,000 staff. Dr. Sugart is a published poet and songwriter and author of Leadership in the Crucible of Work. Two years ago, we had him in Albania and had some great events with him. He is a very wise leader, but also servant leader known for his integrity. It is with great pleasure that I give you Dr. Sandy Sugar the floor now. Please, Dr. Sugar. Well, thank you very much, Evis. I appreciate the introduction and, uh, and also the invitation to engage with all of you. I guess as you say, good evening for you. It's uh, just past noon here in Orlando, Florida, where the sun's always shining. Um, so I'm here really just as a colleague to the rest of you, uh, a leader of, of two organizations, large organizations here in the US who for the past year have been navigating as you have the pandemic and all that that's meant both for our organizations, uh, but also for ourselves as leaders and our teams. Um, and uh, for most of my adult life, I've kept um, a very regular journal, a process of of um, thinking deeply, uh, contemplating all that I'm learning at work and trying to understand the dimensions of leadership that either make work uh, deeply nourishing and productive for people or else uh, the opposite, uh, difficult, uh, deconstructing, um, uh, painful, almost a curse. Uh, and I've been interested all my life in, in how leaders make a difference and what people experience at work and what they produce for their communities. And so I've been thinking uh, throughout this year as we've navigated both at the hospital uh, and at the college, uh, and these are both very large organizations. The college has 70,000 students and the, the, um, the hospital system is a $6 billion uh, revenue uh, generator. So they're big organizations. Uh, but you know, I'm a leader also of a family and uh, that's a little bit like a small business. So. Uh, we've all been experiencing this pandemic in new ways, and I've been thinking deeply about what I'm, what I'm learning from all that. What are the lessons in this hard work and, uh, and the challenges that it produces? So what I've been asked to share with you today is, is just a few ideas of the lessons learned, uh, for me anyway. I hope some of these resonate for you. And uh, just to make this easy to, to do, I've organized them in a a common meme uh, here in the US, which is my top 10 lessons. So we'll start with number 10. The first thing I think that that really is a piercing lesson for me is the lesson of vulnerability. We are much more vulnerable than we imagine from day to day. Uh, and I suppose it's healthy not to think about that all the time. 
the um, uh, the adaptation uh, to life as a human being is meant not to be filled with fear and loathing and worry. And unless you've experienced trauma in your life, those sorts of things aren't daily companions. For those who are, we know they're in an unhealthy situation. But most of us live most of our lives probably with an exaggerated sense of security, that things are likely to be okay, that uh, there aren't any imminent threats. And in fact, we have names for people who think otherwise, like paranoid. Um, it, it may or may not be true for any given person or organization, but if you lived in constant fear, uh, you would be paralyzed and unproductive. So, um, but it is well to remember that we're more vulnerable than we imagine not just to take measures in terms of risk management, but to be ready and resilient when the time comes to respond to threats uh, to our well-being together. And to do that, we as leaders have to think more deeply than the rest of our organizations about how robust our systems are, whether our systems and processes, whether our relationships in our organizations and the values we base them on are able to withstand the storm, so to speak. That's our job. And so I'm learning more about how to manage vulnerability for the people for whom I feel responsible. Lesson number nine on my list is connectedness. We're much more closely connected than we imagine from day to day as well. These are, are uh, deeply threatening experiences and they are global threats. And most of the existential threats that we experience now are. Um, these would be things like climate change or global thermonuclear war, or in this case, a worldwide epidemic, a pandemic. And the, the connectedness isn't just that these things spread quickly, but that they can only be solved if everyone's on board with the solution. Uh, there's no protecting any geography, any peculiar geography from the threat of a pandemic. It can't be done. Uh, viruses don't know borders. And so our anachronistic, our historical uh, tribalism, where we're gonna take care of ourselves and others have to take care of themselves, even our nationalism fails to address the threat. And I think uh, part of what many of us are learning is that we've got to mature as a species into a deeper sense of the connectedness of all humanity that all human beings are valuable and that we have to work together to solve these problems. That connectedness is a leadership issue. People on their own are not likely to gravitate towards loving their neighbor, particularly when their neighbor is half a world away and doesn't look or sound or speak like them. That's our job to help them make that transition. Number eight, we're more resilient than we imagined. Yes, we're more vulnerable. Yes, we're more connected and we're much more resilient. What I have seen in leading the hospital system and leading the college has been extraordinary and you've seen things too. At the college, we in about seven days converted 6,000 courses from traditional face-to-face -face experiences to online experiences. And during that same time, we converted all services, everything we do, financial aid, advising, all of the business transactions, everything this quarter of a billion dollar organization does, we converted to remote services and working from home in about 10 days. I would never have guessed that was possible. Uh, I would never have guessed a year later that people would be flourishing in spite of all the adaptations required, but the outcomes have been extraordinary. Um, and I see that in other organizations at the hospital system, for example, when early in the pandemic, we weren't sure if we had the resources just to protect our nurses and doctors, much less to serve the many uh, very ill people who are coming to us in our intensive care units. But within days, we figured out uh, within the hospital system how to set up our own testing labs and do rapid testing and tracking, how to protect people with uh, protective gear uh, that wasn't available easily on the market, but we could manufacture. Uh, how to put protocols in place that protected patients, families, and caregivers within days. And still today, those things are in place. And I've gotten to see it, I'm sorry to say, uh, very close up as 
the pandemic took both of my parents uh, this year, one in, in uh, last April and one in October, and I sat by their side in full protective gear in these hospitals holding their hands as they passed. Uh, resilience uh, like I never imagined we would see. I think that's worth celebrating and noting in our colleagues and cultivating in our own leadership. So that's 10, nine, eight, number seven. <clears throat> um, we have to pivot now. We have to pivot as leaders from managing ourselves through the storm back to our central purpose. When you're the captain of the ship and the waves are coming over the gunnels and the wind is howling and you're in the middle of a terrible storm, the temptation is to manage the storm. To that, the, the rest. But it turns out that that's not enough for people, that that actually exhausts their resources very quickly, that the loss of mission is as significant a loss as the loss of safety. And as leaders, it's part of our responsibility, I think, to remember that while we navigate the storm, we're still on a journey to some point on the horizon, that the mission of our organization is still central. So we have to manage the storm, but we have to keep our forward momentum towards the mission or our people lose their connection to the work. I think that's one of the sources of resilience that we talked about earlier is to stay on mission and remember what we're about. I saw this uh, in extraordinary ways, again, both at the hospital and at the college. And I think staying on mission and not allowing our deeper callings and our strategy to be compromised by the storm is a leadership responsibility. Just one example, the hospital system was in the early stages of acquiring another hospital system, a merger and acquisition, an M&A transaction. Uh, we were buying, acquiring about a billion and a half dollar hospital system, uh, oh, about 80 miles away from Orlando in St. Pete, Florida. Uh, nearly all of the hospital systems in America are doing this sort of thing all the time. There's a, a sort of an aggregation of healthcare now, so the smaller hospitals are merging into larger hospitals in order to survive the economics of healthcare. Nearly everybody else in the country paused because of the economic uncertainties caused by the pandemic. But we looked one another in the eye and said, no, we, have a, we still have a strategy and we still have a destination towards which we're navigating. And we completed that transaction in the middle of the pandemic. The result of that is that the integration of this hospital we've acquired into the deep culture of our larger hospital system has already begun. And the quality of their health outcomes and their viability as, an, as a business are both much improved even during the pandemic. So I think a leadership learning for me has been keep your eye on the horizon even when there's a storm raging around the boat. Next, the, we've learned that technology can do some extraordinary things. And my guess is that most of what we're experiencing is a result of things like we're dealing right now, using technology to leverage talent and access to get our work done at a distance uh, has accelerated changes in our work models, our business models, um, even our social gathering models. Everything that we do is being touched by technology in ways that probably would have happened anyway, but at a much faster rate now. The rate of change because of technology and its um, centrality to navigating through the pandemic uh, has accelerated greatly. And change is hard for people. But I don't believe change is what frightens people. I think what frightens people and paralyzes them is not change, but loss or fear of loss. What losses will I incur as a result of this change in my life and the way I work and so on? And there are legitimate concerns for that. Um, I think there's really opportunities in the use of technology. We've learned that there's work that can be done from home, for example. There's work that can be done asynchronously. I think the labor market's going to change because we can source talent anywhere in the world using remote technologies. And I think that deals people in to prosperity from places that might not have it locally uh, and creates the opportunity for participation in a, in a flourishing way in a global economy. 
but it also isolates and disempowers and depersonalizes people. The tools themselves can be used either way, and they have consequences either way, and the tools don't decide. We do. In technology specifically, and in all the forces associated with globalization, there are no resources for deciding what ought to be done, just what can be done. It's up to leaders to apply values to those things, to guide globalism, to guide the uses of technology, to guide the integration of world markets in ways that cause human beings to flourish and not be dehumanized. And I think that's a great learning from this. I see it locally up close, but I also see it as a global issue. Everything we do with our technologies, we ought to test against our anthropology. What do I mean by that? Everything we do, every process we design, every tool we create implies something about humanity, what we believe it means to be human. And usually we haven't included that as an explicit design principle when we design them. They're implicit. What does your process imply? A simple example, many, many companies have a, um, a reward system for the employees that basically says, if you get the strategy right and you can align incentives to the strategy, then people will be productive. I think that's a bankrupt anthropology. Human beings are much more comp complex than that, much more uh, deeply rooted in their work. And work is a much more personal thing than that. It's not necessarily a bad thing to incent performance, but people are incented by lots of things other than money, like belonging, like purpose, like meaning, uh, like human appreciation uh, and connection. These are all a richer anthropology about what it means to be human. I think it's our job, again, to make explicit what we believe it means to be human and design our systems in ways that enhance the dignity and freedom and uh, joy and experience of every human being if we can. Our organizations will flourish when we do that and so will the communities we serve. I would just call that human-centered design. My next insight for you is um, that we weren't made for the kind of prolonged, sustained stress that we and those we lead are experiencing. Human beings were fashioned. If you look deeply at our physiology, and let me just pause and say, my training originally is as a chemist and in uh, the areas of cognitive science, how the brain works. That's why my work both in a healthcare system and at a college has, has been relevant. Um, so I'm speaking now maybe as a scientist. We weren't made for prolonged stress. Human physiology is adapted to acute stress, short bursts of stress, followed by long interludes of peace. Think of, uh, think of a, an ancient human being standing on the plain and noticing, I don't know, a saber-toothed tiger off on a rock in the corner somewhere. And our response to that is visceral. It's the flight or, or fight response. And it activates glands in our systems that turn on our nervous system and our endocrine system and cause us to react with fight or flight and it saves our lives. But those reactions come at a price. Uh, and that price is noticed when the stress is not momentary, but is prolonged over weeks, months, and years. What prolonged stress does is cause what's called an allostatic shift. It changes the physiology of your body. It changes the neurological responses of your body. And it causes you to be much more likely to experience hypertension, high blood pressure. Um, it, it is an immunosuppressor. So you're more subject to infection and disease. It causes depression. It makes people vulnerable to alcoholism. Most interestingly is it changes what's called your cortisol physiology. Uh, cortisol has to do with the way that you process energy in your body. It actually makes you fat. Stress makes you fat. It's not just that people eat sometimes out of stress, but the body actually stores more calories as fat when you're under stress because the cortisol um, physiology is designed 
to prevent you from starving to death. So when you activate that chain of physiological events, it's as, it's as though you were starving and the body says, pack away some pounds. I don't know about you, but the COVID-15 is a real thing here, um, uh, particularly working from home where the kitchen is only a few steps away, but it has more to do with your physiology. Again, as leaders, we're charged with the care of ourselves and the people we lead. And I wonder what our responsibility is for reducing stress, that, that ongoing, uh, long-term, prolonged, and damaging stress. How can we relieve that kind of stress on the people around us? If we're too focused on surviving as an organization, we lose sight of the fact that the organization is actually a network of relationships between human beings. And if the humans aren't healthy, the network's not healthy. Um, so let me encourage you to think more deeply about your responsibilities as a leader for the health of yourself and those around you. So as we emerge from the pandemic, which I think we will over the course of the next six months, uh, we emerge as organizations that still have a reservoir of health uh, to bring to bear on our missions. Uh, number three in my long list of 10 counting down is when you can't be sure what to do, to be sure about what you care about. We live in an environment where I can't tell you what's gonna happen in three months or four months or five months or six months. Uh, we've been living this way for a while. How do you schedule people three months from now? In, in my academic work, how do you build a schedule of classes for next fall? Will it be safe or not safe? How safe? Should people be meeting face-to-face -face or online? In what percentages and what numbers? There's no way to know those things. We are guessing all the time. And this is very unsettling for our organizations. People like to know what's going to happen. They expect their leaders to have a kind of foresight that allows us not, not to predict the future exactly, but to plan it. And we're in an environment where it's not possible to do that. So what do you do instead? Well, you still try to plan and you couch that plan conditionally. The language we're using quite a lot is, this is our best present outlook. Here's what we think is happening. This is what our current thinking is, and here's why. So we couch all of our planning based on a condition that says we don't actually know what's gonna be true four months from now in the public health arena, uh, but using our best present knowledge, here's what we're going to do. What makes that tolerable is we also spend a lot of time reminding people, here's what we care about. When you don't know what tactics you're going to use and how those decisions are going to be made, people trust if they understand the values on which they're going to be made. This is where the deep, the deep work of culture in our organizations, where people learn to, to believe the values we say because we walk them every day. They've seen them demonstrated. This is where it really pays off. This is where they can say, I trust these people not because I know what they're going to do, but I know why they'll do what they do. I know how they'll make these decisions and how they'll listen to us in the process. So most of us don't know what we're gonna do three months from now with regard to the pandemic. There's a lot of variables out there, but I wonder if the people we lead know how we'll make the decision, what we really care about and the, how those values will shape the decisions we make. That's where trust comes from. And speaking of trust, number two, words like trust and meaning and forgiveness and good and evil and character and love and hope, words that are at the core of all human literature and art and drama, words that are the central words of the stories, the themes of the stories we live and love, these words are alienated from our work lives. And our work lives are much poorer for it. These are overriding human qualities. And we've spent, oh, some decades now, maybe going back to the 1920s, hollowing out both the experience and the language of work around an idea that we could um, 
we could manage scientifically. In fact, in the literature, it's called scientific management. Um, it's, it's a dead field. It's an over application of tenuous social science theories to the world of work that is so much richer than they can measure. They've been driven out of our vocabulary and they're driven out then of the lexicon of tools that we have to pay attention to. We need to, we need to re ingratiate these words in the workplace and think deeply as leaders about how trust is born in a relationship about how meaning is made together out of the facts that that confront us and how we build the narrative, the story of our shared work together. We need to invite forgiveness back to work. Most, most places either ignore failure because it's uncomfortable or they banish the person they think has failed from the organization. And in the process, they lose a lot of institutional memory and talent, but they also lose a lot of trust. How do you forgive people that fail at work? We need to confront the issues of good and evil at work. Work has become a technical field, but the consequences of our work for other people's lives have to be evaluated morally. And I think that's the leader's job is to lead the conversations, convene the conversations, not about whether we're effective, not about whether we've made more money um, or produced more widgets, but also about whether our impact in the world is good or evil. Without that responsibility, then the leader is really just a manager and you're a prisoner of the systems you've made rather than the architect. I think too, we have to learn how to love properly at work and hold people in deep regard. There are many kinds of love. One of my favorite books in college was a book called The Four Loves by a man named C.S. Lewis who wrote about the different kinds of love that are described in Greek language. Uh, they are eros and, and uh, agape and philios. These are Greek words for love. Uh, I'm talking here about philios, the, the brotherhood and sisterhood of all humanity. How do, we, how do we bring those things back to our work? If we can repatriate those kinds of themes in our work, the story we write together in our shared work will be powerful and lasting and purposeful and impactful on human community. Otherwise, we're just chasing numbers. So while we're talking about that, my number one lesson from this past year has been on one of those words, and the word is hope. Some years back in psychology, a famous, really more philosopher than psychologist named Abraham Maslow um, wrote about a powerful idea. It's called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You probably know about it. It's taught in most management classes. Think of it as a pyramid. And it says each level of the pyramid has to precede the next level. So before a person can, can perform well, there are needs that have to be met. And the baseline need is survival. Am, am I going to live? The next level of need has to do with Am I safe? Am I well fed? Am I warm? Am I going to be okay? And then it goes up to the next level of needs, which have to do with belonging and so on. And the argument is, unless these lower level needs are made, are met, excuse me, it's not possible to ask people to perform at high levels, to self-actualize would be the word that he would use. Uh, it's a powerful idea, and I think there's a lot of utility in it. But it's also true that some of the most important work people have done in all of history has been done when their lower level needs were very much at risk and not being met. Think of the literature written behind the Iron Curtain of an Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Think of uh, well, just almost any of the extraordinary things people have done when their lives were at risk for one reason or another. I think what's essential for human performance, particularly for our shared performance, the things we do together, uh, isn't necessarily safety. I think it's hope. Hope is a powerful idea. And we need to bring that word back into leadership as well. What is hope? Well, I think it's the food for human souls. It's where people 
decide to invest themselves. And my, my survival may be threatened, but if I have hope for my children, I'm willing to invest or hope for the next generation or hope for whoever follows me. Hope is what propels us into the future, even when we're at risk. What is hope? What's your definition of hope? That'll be a discussion question maybe later. Uh, my favorite definition of hope actually comes from the Christian scriptures, and it says, hope is the assurance of things unseen. Hope is the assurance of things unseen. It's not a wish. It's not, it's not a, a, a fantasy. Um, hope is not um, luck. Hope is not a bet. It's not a gamble. Hope is assured. It's something you fervently believe is true. And it's something you can't prove to others is true because it's, it's relational. Everywhere where I see authentic hope, it comes out of a relationship. You don't hope in systems. You don't hope in philosophies. You don't hope in technologies. You hope in human beings. You hope in somebody else's testimony of the truth. In whom will our followers hope? How will we instill hope in them that the future is out there to be grasped if we'll hang in there together, if we'll do our best work? They may be looking to you. It's a heavy responsibility. And whom do you look to? Where does your hope come from? Not what, but whom? Again, in my tradition, uh, there's a person in whom I hope. Uh, it is a person I met 40 years ago, a person who died 2,000 years ago. I have a hope, and just I can echo with another who wrote about that hope that I know whom I've believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep everything I've committed to him until the day when he makes all things well. But you need to decide where your hope is. 10 things I've learned, 10 things as a leader among hundreds. You could probably add to this list for quite a long time, uh, but these are just little insights, mostly drawn from my journal. Last me, let me say this, whatever's happening in your life, your family life and your work life, however hard the pandemic has hit, everything you're doing is not just shaping the world around you. The world around you is shaping you. You're becoming somebody by what you do, and you need to be deeply aware of that. Let me invite you into self-awareness at a level now that you maybe never had before. Certainly, if you're working from home, there's time for it. Take the time to ask yourself the questions, both these kinds of questions and others that emerge from your work. Who are you becoming? Who are you turning into as a result of what you're doing, the, the stresses that you're wrestling with? the successes and failures in your business and other life. Um, I have a hope. I have a hope that all of us will be transformed. That's my hope, and it comes from a person. I hope you will be too. Thank you very much, Dr. Sugart. Uh, uh, while you are sharing, we've had some questions uh, come through in the chat window. So let's take uh, some of them. Uh, the time, we have still uh, 20 minutes. Uh, we can take some of the questions. So is the first question is uh, from Sue, uh, who wrote, Dr. Sugar, what other leadership qualities are needed for a time of crisis? Great question. And I would say all, you know, leaders come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. We all have gifts that we bring to the work. And most of the time, your best work is done when you understand your own gifts and you work to your strengths. Know what your gifts and strengths are and don't try to act out of your weaknesses. That's why I think leadership, which is often thought of as a kind of a heroic solo sport, really is a team sport. So the first thing I would do uh, and always do under stress is understand, is this my best game? Or is there someone in my team who does this better than I do? And make it a team sport. Look for others who have gifts that complement yours um, and, and 
give trust. There's the second um, quality I think is really important. It's especially important under stress. We've had this equation backwards for a long time. We've always wanted to have leaders that we could trust. And that's a useful thing. And we've often been disappointed. But sometimes that blinds us to the fact that we also need to have leaders who trust us and be leaders who trust those that they lead. Uh, when things are difficult, I lean into listening more than speaking. Most leaders talk a little too much and listen a little too little. I'd encourage you to be uh, the deepest and most sympathetic listener you can be with your team. The third is to, to embody the hope that you're describing, to be hopeful, not just to speak hopeful words or cast a hopeful spell, but to live hopefully, plan for the future, look for the, the good in things, develop opportunity for people, imagine what things will be like on the other side. And lastly, I think this kind of powerful uh, disruption of our work also opens the door for a kind of paradigm shift. Um, it allows us to step back from our work and say, in the post-pandemic era, how would we want things to work and engage in processes of design and collaboration that create the world we want to be a part of rather than just feeling victimized by what happens? Thank you. Uh we have a second question from Daniel Krejci. Uh, the question is, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on how can we start uniting people globally today? How to start minimizing this constant fight and race with each other? And most importantly, how to start explaining to everyone it's a good direction? So there are like three mini questions. Yeah, so... Um... I wish I could answer them definitively. Um, as a, I'm, not a, I'm not a political scientist, and I've been appalled, as you have been appalled, uh, by much of the behavior of our political leaders uh, over, over all my life, really. Uh, uh, let me say this, because what I do know about is, is humanity. Um, human communities, working communities of human beings are formed around objects of common love. The question to ask isn't just uh, what's dividing us, but what will unite us? Uh, so it's one thing to remove an obstacle. There'll be another. There'll be another after that. Um, and fear and tribalism and nationalism and those sorts of things um, will always be with us. But human communities are formed uh, around objects of common love. So ask the question, what is it we all love? How do we get into the conversation that says, how do we coalesce around these objects of common love? I think that's a more powerful question um, than just how do we get along. Um, and, um, and it cuts to a, a really core issue. Um, and that issue is, what's the source of human value? Um, so uh, sometimes I'm, I'm having these conversations with small groups, and I had this one in, in Poland. And she said, very valuable. And I said, how, how valuable is very valuable? And she said, well, infinitely valuable. And I said, good. Why? Why is your child so valuable? Your child's not valuable because of what she can do and produce, is she? No. She's not valuable because of what she may do or produce in the future? No, that's not the source of value. What is the source of human value? What causes us to love our children? And by the way, your neighbor's children, are they valuable? How valuable are they? Are they less valuable than your children? No, they're infinitely valuable as well. How about a child with Down syndrome? Is that child infinitely valuable? Yes, she said. So, so I think we have a big question looming over us. What's the source of the value of a human being? I think wrestling with those issues is more likely to lead us to the objects of common love. 
So let me partially answer that question, not entirely, because I think you have to answer it for yourself. But I would offer, again, this notion that we need to rethink our anthropology. I think there are really only two ways to look at the world. Of all the philosophies and, and uh, anthropologies can fall into one of these two categories. The first category says, look around you. Everyone you see is just here for a minute. They're temporary. They're mortal. They'll be gone in just in a second almost. And since they're not going to be around, what must really matter in life is what they leave behind, their legacy, what they produce, the civilizations they create, the poetry they write, the music they make, the family that they've nurtured into being, something. This is a very winsome philosophy because we're all in touch with our mortality on this earth. The, the name for this is materialism. If people are temporary and stuff is permanent, then stuff is what matters. And the problem with this philosophy is that you can justify almost any kind of harm to another human being for the sake of the legacy you're creating. Nearly every evil leader in history has done that. The alternate view is to say, look around you. Everything you see is temporary that the second law of thermodynamics applies everywhere in the universe that we know about. And it will all be gone, except in some way that we can't quite explain the person sitting across the table from you. We all entertain the hypothesis that there's something about personhood that's more permanent than things, that somehow personhood is behind everything, maybe even person with a capital P. I would call that a sacred anthropology. It entertains the transcendence of the human spirit, of a soul, and it invites you into an inquiry to figure out if that's true, if, if human beings are eternal somehow, if personhood lasts, then what's the, what universe am I really living in? Am I living in the universe described by the materialists or not? And I, I wanna commend you into that inquiry I think that's where all the great art, literature, religion, um, and human creativity has, uh, has contributed to our conversation all these years. Um, uh, materialism, I think, is desiccating. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Enrico Tseco from Albania. His question is the following. Forecast is always difficult, especially under the unstable situation the world and organizations are facing currently. So is forecasting requiring some other skills which current leaders don't have? Uh, Enrico, that's a very good question. And I think um, there are both skills and tools to be developed. So uh, uh, from my experience, um, people tend to, um, tend to rely too heavily on the tool with which they're most familiar or the skill with which they're most familiar. So I would argue that leaders need to develop the whole toolbox. So you've heard the old adage, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. So if your tools for understanding the future for, for foresight are all economic or they're all technological or they're all political, then you tend to think in those terms only. I think a kind of multidisciplinary approach is what the complexity of the world requires now so that you can gather data and insight from multiple fields and triangulate that to form a more coherent picture of the future. So I, I think, and I think this as an educator as well, that the way we should be preparing people for life and especially for leadership is multidisciplinary. So I'm trained as a chemist, I'm an active poet and musician, and I read everything I can get my hands on out of field. I hardly ever read a management book anymore. Um, I read poetry and philosophy and um, current affairs and uh, you know philosophical analysis. And I, I just, I wanna encourage you to think about becoming a polymath, becoming a complete 
a complete student of reality, not just um, not just a one a one song wonder. Um, finally, I would say um, all of that is useless unless it's grounded. And by grounded, I mean unless it it has roots in some sort of spiritually um, real um, outlook on what it means to be human. Thank you. Uh, I think we will take two more questions. Uh, one is from Aaron Robinson. You mentioned both vulnerability and resilience. Some of the people we lead have gone through much personal and professional loss. Can you share how you have discerned how to adjust expectations for performance during this time to keep going forward the mission, but lead people who have been shaken? Mm. It's a great question. And I think there are two or three things that have been especially helpful in, in my work. Uh, one is that uh, when people feel this loss and exhaustion from all this, the, the biggest loss they feel is a loss of agency. They feel victimized. I have no control over what's happening to me. Um, and that's the most compelling loss. So I think as leaders, we can, we can begin to develop ways to give people agency again. Um, pivoting out of normal work into remote work, for example, seemed hard at the time. It's actually much easier than pivoting back the other way. And so right now we're trying to figure out which professors will teach which courses to how many students in what environment, all those sorts of things. And I think it's vital that they have a lot of voice in that, that we give them as much choice as we can possibly give them. So they have agency in crafting the way they're navigating back into some kind of normal life. So agency, give people agency when you can. Second is people, people need rest. Um, so we're looking for ways, uh, you know, the, the, in my tradition, we have a thing called Sabbath. In my academic tradition, we have a thing called sabbatical. They both mean the same thing. The word simply means stop work. Human beings weren't made to work all the time even those of us who kind of feel like workaholics. Um, I think creating Sabbath, creating sabbatical for your teams could be really valuable. So finding ways, and it may not be just saying, don't work for a while. It, the Sabbath for them might actually be coming back to work in some ways or giving them work to do when the work they've had uh, has gone away. One example I have of that is we have many staff people at the college whose job, who had nothing to do. When the college closed and we went remote, the administrative assistants, for example, in offices of faculty and staff and deans really had no work to do. And, and that was a great loss to them. So we offered them a different kind of work. We said, would, would you like to reach out to our students? So they made over 100,000 telephone calls to students who had been moved from face-to-face -face classes to online classes and who are, who are experiencing job loss and family disruption and illness and all the other things that the pandemic brought, that made over 100,000 calls to say, how are you doing? Is there anything we can help you with? They gave counseling, they, they steered people to services, they unstuck their administrative processes. It was meaningful work for them. And for them, that was sabbatical. Um, so I think understanding what loss they're experiencing and trying to compensate that loss with other meaningful work uh, can be useful. Thank you. And the last question from Dan Elliott, uh, Dr. Sugart, from what you shared, I get the impression that the concept of hope or the spiritual aspect of your life is important to you personally. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, I can't, uh, there's not much time and it's a long story, so I'll give you just the the thumbnail sketch of that. Uh, I grew up as, uh, um, as a person enamored of science uh, and the arts and how those two came together. I was a skeptic with regard to faith and, um, and trained again as a scientist with an artistic background. And um, I had a, a pervasive interest in the question of truth 
How do you know the truth is true? What makes truth true? How does your mode of inquiry create truth? How do you know anything? And that's what led me into the sciences and later into cognitive science in particular. Um, and in that quest for understanding what makes the truth true, I had a, a really a conversion experience to the Christian faith. And I found um, reliable evidence, I thought, that this man, Jesus, lived, uh, died, suffered, um, and rose again from the dead. I never expected to find that evidence, and there it was, and it was irrefutable. I still wasn't a believer. I was still skeptical and hard-hearted about it, but over the course of some years, came to believe and to follow um, that faith. Um, and my hope is really in the notion that we are not in charge. Uh, we are creatures, not creators, that we there is a creator who's in charge of all things, and my job is to work with the grain of the universe he made uh, and uh, to, to behave otherwise, to behave selfishly, to behave unfaithfully, and so on, is to live against the grain of the way that the universe was made, and it's painful and difficult. Um, and I find joy in, um, in grounding everything I do in that faith. Thank you very much, Dr. Sugart. Your ideas are so rich and encouraging. Uh, since it is the end of uh, your speech, uh, please, if you can share what are some of the conclusion that, uh, what would be a conclusion that you'd like to leave us with? So uh, how about a poem? <clears throat> so here's a poem for you. This one's not one of mine. It's, it was written by a friend of mine named David White, who's a wonderful poet. And uh, so this, let me say it for you. It's called Sometimes. Sometimes, if you move, care walk carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories who could cross a shimmering bed of dried leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only purpose is to disturb you with tiny but frightening requests coming from nowhere, but in this place, leading everywhere. Requests to stop what you are doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. Questions that have waited patiently for you. Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have no right to go away. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wrestle with the questions. They're waiting for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great, great uh, speech and great time with you. Now it is time to go to your country-specific Zoom meeting.